I think I might as well confess my ignorance by asking you, right at the start, who was Gurdjieff? Well, at the end of his life, to the children of his quartier in Paris near the Arc de Triomphe, he was just a kindly old gentleman who always seemed to have sweets in his pocket. But, of course, he made many strange reputations. Earlier in his life, some knew him as an expert in oriental carpets. But you might equally well have met him as a shoeshine boy in Rome, or as a guide to the tourists visiting the pyramids, or as a physician practicing hypnotism in Montmartre, or perhaps in Bukhara making artificial flowers. You see, it's difficult. You can't really label him. He used to say, I, universal. He defied classification. He, he was never the same. It sounds a very romantic sort of life, very free. Did he come from the Mediterranean? The name sounds Russian to me. Actually, he was a Greek, born in eastern Turkey. You're not so far out. In those mid-19th century days, long before the Russian Revolution, it was a very interesting part of the world. All sorts of different civilizations washed up there. Jews, Russians, Kurds, Armenians, Indians, Persians, even the odd soldier of the British Raj. And he grew up in this sort of multinational stew. And while he was still a boy, he was evidently very lively and precocious. He studied greedily and soon began asking very awkward questions, the sort to which there really weren't any answers. But it seems to have started one day when he happened to join some people doing table turning. I expect you did it when you were young. Nonsense, of course. But after all, what made the table legs lift? Where did the answers come from? Were they really the spirits of the dead? People came up with the usual phony explanations, but none of it made any sense to the young Jeff. But then he came across other things far more baffling. For instance, he went on a pilgrimage to the tomb of a saint who was said to have miraculous powers of healing. There were hundreds of people going there on the saint's day, and among them was a young man being carried along on a cart. One of his legs and part of his side were paralyzed. The church containing the tomb was on a hillside, and a steep stony path led up to it. And when they lifted the young man down from the cart, he refused all offers of help, and he began to drag himself up by his arms. It was pitiable to watch, and it took him three hours. But he persevered, and finally fell exhausted at the foot of the tomb and prayed. It was then the miracle happened. The young man found he could move his limbs. At first he didn't seem to understand. Then he jumped to his feet with a shout, he could stand. He could walk. He was cured. Then he fell on his knees and the whole congregation knelt and gave thanks. But what had happened? How had it happened? We always find the miraculous difficult to cope with. Yes, I suppose it's because people don't like things they can't explain. But there were other incidents just as inexplicable. Perhaps the most remarkable was Gurdjieff's encounter with the Yezidis. This was when he was still a young boy. He'd gone to the public playground and was sitting working under a tree. Suddenly he heard a shout, as if somebody was being hurt, so he jumped up and ran to see what was the matter. What he saw was a little boy in great distress, sobbing and making strange movements. He appeared to be unable to get out of a circle, which some other boys had drawn round him in the dust. The boys were standing and laughing at him. But not till Gurdjieff rubbed out a bit of the circle with his foot could the prisoner escape and run off. Gurdjieff stood transfixed. What power had held him prisoner? Again, it was a mystery. There were evidently powers that were quite inexplicable, and the usual excuses, magic, second sight, coincidence, sorcery, seemed just ways to avoid people giving a reasonable answer. But there were, there must be true explanations, true answers. But where? Somehow, ancient knowledge, forgotten powers had been lost or hidden. And so it was then Gurdjieff conceived the impossible idea that it was his destiny to search for and rediscover these truths. Very strange. To take it so seriously, I mean. I think quite a lot of people do have experiences, odd experiences, but we just accept that there's no answer and forget about it. But how does this young man, hardly out of his teens, even begin to go about finding answers to questions like these? I don't suppose he knew himself to begin with. But he read voraciously, and he had an uncanny facility with languages, too. Plus, of course, the enthusiasm and confidence of youth. And I think something more. 
a nose for the scent, as you might say, a sort of flair. Anyhow, the long and the short of it was, in a few years, he gathered a number of people around him, archaeologists, engineers, surveyors, doctors, and they decided to form a group. They called it the Seekers After the Truth. And they set out, sometimes working in twos and threes, sometimes together in big expeditions, to explore remote areas in Afghanistan, in Russia, India, Tibet, China, and so on, always with the same aim, which from various clues had now become a conviction that there were places and there were living people who knew these hidden truths. Just like Marco Polo. Yes. I am bound to admit that some of the stories are highly romantic, but others read more like travelogues. He's left some account of all this, then. Oh, yes. In the second series of his writing, which is called Meetings with Remarkable Men, it's a difficult book to put down. There are striking portraits of the strange men who shared the adventures of the search. And there are bits of autobiography, too. He tells of his father, who was, among other things, a noted bard or medieval storyteller. And of his first tutor, the Archbishop of Kars, a town in eastern Turkey where Gurdjieff was brought up. But then there are bits of pure adventure. For instance, the description of a long hooded journey on horseback to a secret monastery where he refines an old friend whom he'd long ago given up for dead. And a wonderful trip up the river Amudaria on an old paddle steamer. And how he penetrated into Kafiristan, a part of the world where strangers were liable to disappear rather suddenly. And there found a brotherhood, some of whose fathers lived for two centuries or more. After he'd written about all this, I suppose the places became tourist attractions. <laughs> I don't think so. He took care to cover his tracks. The stories are told quite simply, but when you try to work out where the places really were, it's tantalizingly vague. But do you believe the stories are really true? Yes, up to a point. But the aim of these tales is not just entertainment. It's part of an overall plan. His first work, All and Everything, is a merciless, impartial dissection of the way we human beings live here on Earth and how we've missed the road of normal development. It's a difficult book, not easy to understand or accept, though the seeds of a new reality are there, even if they take a few centuries to germinate. But the second series is cunningly contrived to lure the reader into a new attitude to the living of life. It's full of warmth and humor. Maybe that's why you come back to it again and again. How were all these journeys paid for, financed? Did they have some kind of a sponsor? <laughs> Heavens, no. Did you remember that Sufi story about the novice who asked the master if he followed the teaching how much money he'd be allowed to make? As much money as you can make with your left foot, was the answer. The aim was the thing. Money to reach the next step would be earned or it would turn up somehow. It wasn't of any importance. After all, they were young. Gurdjieff, as a matter of fact, was endlessly resourceful in making money. He was never at a loss. He dived for pennies round the ferries of the Bosphorus. He painted sparrows and passed them off as American canaries. He worked as a tourist guide. He made paper flowers. Once, when he needed a very large sum of money, he set up a universal workshop which guaranteed to repair anything and everything. That was a prodigious effort. But in a few months, he made a fortune. At the time, his aim required it. And his aim, of course, never faltered or varied. At his death, he didn't earn a penny. But did they really find anything? Was it really worthwhile? I think it must have been a bit baffling to begin with. It was rather like a treasure hunt, you know. There were clues, signs to follow, casual hints, little tips that paid off. And gradually, don't forget these searches lasted for 20 years, gradually they found what they were looking for. And then what happened? Then the group dispersed. Some went into retreat, some disappeared, some gave up, some died. But it really wasn't the end, it was the beginning. The group had been formed for a purpose and had fulfilled the purpose. And now Gurdjieff came back to distill out of all this experience the essence of the effort. How old was he then? In his fifties. And he came back with all the answers? In his head, yes. You mean nothing was written down? No. At first he tried to set up his teaching, his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man, as he called it, in Moscow. But it was 1916, the First World War had started and the Russian Revolution followed. Nothing was possible in Russia. So, after desperate adventures, he escaped by the Crimea to Constantinople 
and finally settled near Paris, where he again set up the Institute. One phase of his work was over, but the most important was still ahead. It was a great question, still is. How do you present, how do you pass on a new teaching? Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, just lived their teaching and left the recording of it to others. That could lead to distortion. What Gurdjieff taught was too complex, too difficult to be left to what others could remember. So he determined to set it all down himself, and the result was his masterwork, All and Everything, a book of deep complexity which really does seem to question everything existing in the world. But, as if that were not enough, he added another dimension to the teaching, another world, the sacred dances, or movements, as they are called, which teach, not through the head, but by the postures of the body itself. And beyond that again, there was his music, these strange gems of sound written for special occasions. Here's one to close the program with. Last time we met, you told me quite a lot about Gurdjieff's life. But you told me almost nothing about his teaching. But now, can you give me some lines to think about? Some ideas of where to start? I mean, supposing I wanted to study these ideas further. It's actually difficult to know where to begin. Perhaps with all and everything, the Gurdjieff Bible. Because, you see, it's a very modern book. It could only have been written in the 20th century. It all takes place in a spaceship. And he consists of the tales that the storyteller Beelzebub tells to his grandson to while away the time as they go on their business between the various stars in the galaxy. The conversation turns to the years Beelzebub spent in exile on a remote, insignificant solar system, and in particular about some very odd creatures on one of the planets in that solar system, called Earth. So you see, from the start a perspective is set, the Earth's viewed objectively, impartially, as a very small and unimportant place. As if seen through a telescope. Exactly. Through a very powerful telescope, which can observe everything that's going on. And occasionally, Beelzebub makes personal visits to the surface of the Earth to get a close-up view. And the tales are about what he finds there. Yes, partly. But they also serve as a means of educating his grandson to illustrate to him what can happen to people when they get lost. When they cease to live normally as people do on other planets. So Beelzebub doesn't come from the Earth? No, no, he's a sort of visitor, a sort of envoy who reports back to the centre on the way things are. Then these tales are really fairy stories? Yes, or allegories. But not to be taken literally? Well, not entirely. Parts of them are clearly allegorical, but others sound historical. They're written in such a practical sort of reporter's language, one can't doubt they come from actual experience. That's one of the fascinations of the book. It raises endless questions. You can always find something new in it. But finally, what do these tales add up to? Well, what appears to emerge as you read and reread the book is, uh, how should I describe it, a sort of picture of the framework of the universe, of the two fundamental laws that brought it all into existence and govern the pattern of its life and growth, a sort of picture of the tree of life rooted in God the Father from whom all proceeds, and then descending through a proliferation of beings at all levels, worlds, suns, planets, even down to us on Earth, insignificant as we are. It sounds like a story of the creation. It is. But it goes even further than Genesis. It tells why the universe had to be created. Why? Can there be an answer to such an impossible question? Yes, quite a simple one. It's simply the victory of the Creator over time. You see, time is the universal destroyer. Left to itself, it would reduce the whole creation to dust. So our uni-being creator realized that if he did not challenge this disaster, even he and the then sole place of his dwelling would also be annihilated. And having pondered this, he decided to create a living world so constructed that it would maintain itself at every level by reciprocal feeding, that is, everything feeding on or being fed by everything else. And from then on, life began eternally to renew itself. And so, the divine anxiety for the future disappeared forever. What an extraordinary idea. Yes, it is. But when you come to think about it, what else is creation? Simply the renewal, the winding up of something which would otherwise only run down. 
time ought to destroy everything, but it doesn't. However, all this is only one side of his work. The other is a detailed dissection of the nature of man, who is a minute but perfect replica of the whole, a world in himself. Now that's easier. I do sometimes see that I'm a sort of world in myself. But just now I want to go back to those other beings you spoke of, the suns and the planets. Are you suggesting they're alive? That the sun is alive, that the earth is alive? Of course. The whole universe is alive. How could a living God father a dead universe? But we must stretch our understanding. Life isn't just our life. There is life at all levels. The sun creates and maintains all life on earth. Ancient peoples wiser than we worshipped the sun as God. They were right. We can't think of the cells in our bodies as beings either, but we create them. They live because we live. We are God to them. The laws are the same everywhere. There's no difference except in scale. This is the wonderful new unity that Gurdjieff has brought us. Everything is related to everything else, feeds on everything else, and is fed by everything else. You may be right, but it's such a strange way of looking at things. Well, I'm lost, I really am. I'm not surprised. We all resist change. A new way of looking at things is disturbing. Most people just call it unorthodox nonsense and throw it out. But be patient. Look more closely. Maybe the new way is closer to reality than the old way. For instance, let's take the two nearest levels of beings, above us and below us. Mother Nature above, and the cells of our bodies below. Mother Nature is made up of millions of creatures, beings. Trees, grasses, insects, animals, men, all beings. And together, these cells form the ecology of the whole, the being of the whole, its entity, nature. The lifetime of nature is eternal compared with the lifespan of us, its parts. What do we know of the place and purpose of nature? It's beyond us. The time scale is impossible to grasp. Similarly, the cells of our bodies live for seconds or minutes. Each has its role to play in keeping us alive. But what do these cells know of our purposes, our interests, our lives? Nothing. We are related to nature, dependent on it, part of it, without knowing its purpose. And the cells of our bodies are related to us, dependent on us, part of us, without knowing our purpose. The separation is enormous, zero to infinity, as you might say. And yet, the interdependence is complete. You muddle me. You see, I'm a human being part of nature, as you say. And yet you spoke as if, as if human beings were between nature and the cells we're made up of. Well, not quite. We could be between. Because men and women do occupy a special place on Earth. Because we have the faculty of reason, which no other creatures have. But actually, by our unbecoming behavior, we've lost that place. And a lot of Beelzebub's tales are devoted to spelling out just how and why we've lost it. But still, we do have the possibility of growth, of change, of another kind of future. That's what all religion is about. Has Gurdjieff any recipe for change? Of course. His life work, his destiny, was to rediscover old truths and bring them back. Teach them in such a way that we should really see our situation afresh. See our terrible predicament and how to change it, how to escape from it. Is there a way? Sometimes I doubt it. Yes, there is a way. But to find it and follow it, we have to give up the old attitudes, the old ways. And this is very difficult. We have to begin to try and see ourselves as we are, not as we like to think we are. Our teachers give us another vision of a kind of life, another level of life, and fill us with a wish to be the sort of creatures we could be. But we cannot stay at those levels. We continually fall back. But we have to struggle up again and again, and of course, this weeds people out. Many are called, but few are chosen. Finally, it all comes back to wish. Do we really wish to reach the kingdom of God? To me, it really was extraordinary when I had struggled for many years to try and understand these new ideas that Gurdjieff proposes. Finally, to see, in spite of the excitement, the uplift that this new vision of life had given me, the old truths emerging more vividly, more compulsively, because of the teaching. And what would you say these old truths were? Hard to bear. That we live our lives in sleep, and so the possibility 
of seeing anything real passes us by. We do not know we're asleep. We cannot believe it. It sounds so preposterous, so ridiculous, we don't even bother to examine it. But down the ages, wise men in every serious teaching have always told us the same thing. We are asleep. We live in a world of illusion. Facts outside us can be real. But our ideas about ourselves, our loves, our hopes, our beliefs, are all dreams. But if that's the truth, there's no point in life at all. Try to wake up. Try to watch yourself, even for a little. And you'll begin to see that it is true. Say to yourself, I am. Here. Now. We need not sleep. God has endowed us with other possibilities. This is the destiny of man, the reason for his being created, his hope of immortality, to be a help to the creator in an enlarging world. There's always an eye that simply doesn't want to know. But there's another that's revolted by the lies, the emptiness, the sham of it all. And is somehow certain there must be another sort of life, rock under the feet, safe, could we but find it. But we have to work for it. It's what the Gospels call a pearl of great price. It has to be prayed for, paid for. And our prayer could be, quicken me with the wish to be, O God. For without it, I am nothing. The disturbing thing you said to me last time we met was about sleep. Do you really mean it literally? Is there any evidence that we all live and die in sleep? It's hard to accept a thing like that. I know it's a dreadful thing to face. But if you watch the way you live, you will see it is true. Gurdjieff calls it the terror of the situation. Sleep is so deeply rooted in our lives, so completely accepted by everybody, it passes quite unnoticed. But of course, people get mad at you when you face them with it, when they've never even thought about such ideas. Even when they have, it takes years to digest it. I don't really see what you mean by sleep. Look at the way you live, from moment to moment. Look at the way you react, contradict yourself, dream about things, imagine wildly improbable situations, criticize others, justify yourself, and so on and so on. Most of it adds up to nothing, like dreams. And this is the norm of the human condition. Every serious religion has exhorted its followers to see this, to rise out of their sleep and watch what is really going on. We need not sleep, but the conditions that surround us from birth, the way the world lives and the behavior that is expected of us, all these conspire to keep us where we are. That sounds more like being mechanical than being asleep. Very well, call it mechanical if you like. Gurdjieff defined ordinary man as a machine controlled by external influences. The great thing is to see it. How does that help? Because it's the beginning of a new attitude to life. You think you direct things, act on your own initiative, control your life. But in fact, you only react like a machine to all of the circumstances. There's a famous passage in All and Everything which illustrates it perfectly. I'd like to read it to you. Here it is. You have plenty of money, luxurious conditions of life, and universal esteem and respect. At the head of your well-established concerns are people absolutely reliable and devoted to you. In a word, your life is a bed of roses. In the morning, you wake up under the impression of some oppressive dream. Your slightly depressed state that is first on waking has nevertheless left its mark, a certain languidness and hesitancy in your movement. You go to the mirror to comb your hair and carelessly drop the brush. You've only just picked it up and you drop it a second time. Then you pick it up with a shade of impatience and in consequence you drop it a third time. You try to catch it as it's falling, but for an unlucky blow from your hand the brush makes for the mirror. In vain you try to save it. Crack! There's a star of cracks in that antique mirror which you were so proud. Damn devil, take it! And you experience the need to vent your fresh annoyance on somewhere or other and not finding the newspaper beside your morning coffee, the servant having forgotten to put it there, the cup of your patience overflows and you decide you cannot stand the fellow in the house any longer. It's time for you to go out. The weather being pleasant and not having far to go, you decide to walk. Behind you, 
glides your automobile of the latest model. The bright sunshine somewhat calms you, and the crowd which is collected at the corner attracts your attention. You go nearer, and in the middle of the crowd you see a man lying unconscious on the pavement. A policeman, with the help of some of the, as they're called, idlers who have collected, put the man into a taxi to take him to the hospital. Thanks only to the likeness which has just struck you between the face of the taxi driver and the face of a drunkard you bumped into last year when you were returning somewhat tipsy yourself from a rowdy birthday party, you notice that the accident on the street corner is uncountably connected in your associations with a meringue that you ate at that party. Ah, what a meringue that was. That servant of yours for getting your newspaper today spoiled your morning coffee. Why not make up for it at once? Here is a fashionable cafe where you sometimes go with your friends. But why did you recall the servant? Had you not almost forgotten the morning's annoyances? But now, how very good the meringue tastes with the coffee. Look, there are two ladies at the next table. What a charming blonde. You hear her whispering to her companion, glancing at you. Now, he is the sort of man I like. Do you deny that from these words about you, accidentally overheard, and perhaps intentionally said aloud, the whole of you, as is said, inwardly rejoices? Suppose that at that moment you asked if it had been worthwhile getting fast and losing your temper over the morning's annoyances. You would, of course, answer in the negative and promise yourself that nothing of the kind should ever happen again. Need you be told how your mood was transformed? while you were making the acquaintance of the blonde in whom you were interested and who was interested in you and its state during all the time you spent with her? You return home humming some air and even the sight of the broken mirror only elicits a smile from you. But how about the business on which you'd gone out this morning? Ah, clever. Well, never mind. You can telephone. You go to the phone and dial the wrong number. You dial again and get the same number. Some man informs you that you're bothering him, and you tell him it's not your fault, and what with one word and another, you learn to your surprise that you're a scoundrel and an idiot, and if you ring him again, then... A rug slipping under your feet provokes a storm of abuse, and you should hear the tone of voice in which you rebuke the servant who is handing you a letter. The letter is from a man you esteem, and whose good opinion you value highly. The contents of the letter are so flattering to you that as you read... Your irritation gradually subsides and changes to the pleasant embarrassment of a man listening to a eulogy of himself. I could continue this picture of your day, you free man. Perhaps you think I'm overdrawing. No, it is photographically exact, a snapshot from nature. It's a fascinating bit of storytelling, but I don't see what it's got to do with being asleep. Because the man simply reacts to everything that happens. He reacts to the dropping of the brush, he reacts to the street crowd, to the chance meeting with the blonde, to the telephone call, to the letter. He cannot do anything. Everything happens. Life presses the buttons and the machine reacts. But he needn't. He could react quite differently. But it would still be a reaction, unconscious. The machine reacts. It reacts, not you. If you try to watch, you'll see that your life goes on quite mechanically without your taking part in it. We all think we're the centre of the world, that everything revolves around us. And when we see the centre is really a thousand contradictory people, it's a terrible blow to our assurance, our pride. One of us commits murder, but all of us go to jail. If you don't throw out the idea, you'll find it'll sink in, and you'll get a glimpse of a new reality. But how would a man who wasn't, as you call it, asleep, behave in all these situations? I don't know, but he wouldn't react. He might respond, but that's quite different. Do you remember that game we used to play, to count ten before you answer? To remember in the heat of the moment, to count at all, you had to wake up a bit. And by the time you counted ten, your answer would certainly be very different. Another part would come into the reply. But the trouble is, as far as I'm concerned, I find it almost impossible not to react, not to get involved. To be free from reaction means living from another place in another way. That's why saints are rare. I must say, I find all this pretty depressing. And don't you find life pretty depressing? The struggle, the frustration, the feeling that the world is mad and there's no way out? To try to understand, to study a new model of reality, a new way to look at things, means effort. 
and it's hard at first, but it brings a wonderful hope of freedom, of beginning to live nearer to the truth, to face things as they are, not as we dream they are, of seeing a way through. I feel truth ought to inspire me, to uplift me. But what you say only complicates everything. Yes. Remember how Bernard Shaw put it? You have learned something that always feels at first as if you'd lost something. How to free ourselves from slavery? That's the question. If we manage to watch what's going on, we can't help seeing that we're at the mercy of everything. We can't resist. We can't help ourselves. It's a sort of hypnotism. That's slavery, surely. But I don't admit that I live like this, that I have to live like this. Good, good, good. Indignation is the best way to come to an agreement. Look at it another way. This slavery, this hypnotism, isn't just personal. Do you remember that cry of consternation in the Bible? Why do the nations so furiously rage together, and why do the people imagine a vain thing? Capitalism and communism are enraged by each other's ideologies. Political parties are furious at the policies of their opponents. Religions are at war with one another. The poor envy the rich, and the rich ignore the poor. Wherever you look, on every scale, A is hypnotized by B, and B is enslaved to A. Society must protect its image, even if it leads to perjury, murder, or war. Justice, truth, even God must be seen to be on their side. Society cannot help reacting like this any more than we can. What hypocrisy it all is, we say. But it's just the same with us, personally. We're all tarred with the same brush. We're not doomed to this mechanical reaction, to this universal slavery. Do you think that a man who was awake, who saw his lies, his contradictions, his brutality, could threaten, torture, and kill his fellow men? He would be overcome with remorse. He would remember that he, too, had to die. I do not believe such things would be possible if we were not all asleep. To see this is the key. To awake is the way to the world to come. Yes, I do see what you mean. Or at least I see the possibility. But life isn't like that. People don't even dream about such things, let alone work for them to happen. We can't change the world. No, but we can see what is necessary to change it. How else can change begin? If we couldn't wake up, there would be no hope. The root of all sin is sleep. time I go away and try to sort out what you've been telling me about the teaching of Gurdjieff, I get muddled. You mix up philosophy, psychology and morality with religion. But I make a distinction between talk about religion and religion itself. How would you define religion then? Well, I would say it was man's need to find someone to worship. Yes, but why is that someone worshipped? Because he brings new inspiration into the understanding of ourselves, our neighbours and the nature of divinity. Gurdjieff certainly sets out to do that. And to do it, he has to sweep away all the fantasies and fairy tales we've built up about man and the universe. So it is a strange kind of new religion, then? Well, I think it would be better to avoid clichés. There are many so-called religions about that are little more than facades for impostors to amass money and power. Wise people keep a very sharp look out for those who offer stones, calling them bread, and sawdust labeled cereal. It would be nearer the mark to think of Gurdjieff's teaching as a study of new ideas about the nature of reality. Those who follow him think of themselves as students in a school set up to provide conditions for study. You don't go to school to argue, you go to learn. You bring your questions, your problems. If the answers you get are valid, you can bring more questions. If they're not, nothing compels you to stay. You see, new ideas are very divisive. Many can't accept them. It's always been so. People used to believe that the Earth was flat. Galileo narrowly escaped torture. 
for daring to suggest that the Earth was not the center of the universe. But gradually, new values get established and supersede the old. Truth is like fire. It scares people. They don't want to have their beliefs burned. It's much more comfortable if things remain as they are. Do you think there is any ultimate truth? Your truth, my truth, is a personal matter. We get as far as we can. Truth is the limit of our upward stretch, the limit of our understanding. Many people don't bother about these things. They have no truth of their own. They live by other people's truth. But every so often people come along, like Galileo or Newton or Einstein, who see into things more clearly, more deeply, and change all our ideas about the nature of reality. And you put Gurdjieff into this category? Yes, into it and beyond. He puts so many of our old ideas in question. He says, for instance, that we are born with our true nature, our essence, and that this is overlaid by our personality, a sort of elaborate bogus facade with which we face life. And the stresses between the two are the source of many of our neuroses. Now, this is a striking idea you won't find in any other teaching. And then there is multiplicity, the idea that we're not just one person, but a whole congress of contradictory strangers, each calling himself I, of course, which is something we can easily verify as soon as we begin to observe ourselves. Deeper than all these is the question of levels, practically ignored by everybody today, which is the key to discrimination to the mysteries. I could go on and on, but all the excitement, the hope, comes from seeing things that we've always accepted without thinking, suddenly transformed, alive, in a new way. And as we begin to recognize the little bits of truth we've worked out for ourselves, we find them as just one piece in a larger jigsaw we never dreamed of. It's a wonderful experience to see the connection between things, their place in the structure of life. I think most people don't bother about the big questions. I know I don't. I want practical help, facts, results, before I begin to believe in anything. Ah, so you're a pragmatist. Absolutely. Give me evidence of practical benefits, and I'm ready to be convinced. Very well. Let's be practical. I suppose you've been brought up like everyone else to believe that everything can be worked out by your head, by your intelligence. Do you think that's true? Most of the time, yes. But sometimes people do get worked up. And when their feelings are aroused, goodbye to sanity. I'm glad you admit there is something besides your head anyway. We don't really understand our mechanism. We don't know how the machine works. Gurdjieff clears all this up by explaining that we have three brains, three centers, quite separate, each with its own way of working, its own memory, its own location within the body. These three brains, or three centers, control our thoughts, our feelings, and our habits. Thoughts come from the head. Feelings are mainly concentrated in the solar plexus, and habits, which are really patterns of movement, originate in the spine, in the central nervous system. All three take part in everything that happens to us, but each one does so differently. You always make things so complicated. Sorry. I know you want everything made easy, but life isn't easy, is it? Don't you see that it gets more and more difficult? If you want to learn, you must listen. We know we have brains in our heads. We know we have feelings. We know we have habits. They're all quite different. They all take part in our lives. But how? What is the mechanism? How do we work? How will knowing help? If you want to know how anything works, you have to take it to pieces. If you want to mend it, you must understand it. If you just go on fiddling with it without understanding it, you won't get it to work. Look at the world today. It's grinding to a halt, simply because we really don't understand the nature of the forces at work. We don't understand the mechanism. But you said we can't change the world. You are the world, and the world is you. A grain of salt has exactly the same properties as a ton of it. If we want to understand the way the world goes, we must first understand the way we go. And how will your theory about brains help? It will help to understand what's really going on. Look, 
Let's take a perfectly simple example. You have a friend in trouble. You understand clearly his difficulty, and so, after supper, you sit down to write him a letter. The matter's somewhat urgent, and you intend to get the letter into the post that night. But by the time you've finished, it's late. The weather's bad, it's raining cats and dogs, and it's an awful nuisance to go out. Now, here are the three different brains, the three forces at work. What would you do? Hmm. Well, that depends. Of course. The solution doesn't really matter, but you see the different forces. Your head sees the problem, your feelings see the urgency, and your habits see the inconvenience. Your decision depends on how the three forces are balanced in you. What interests me is the idea of habits being a force. I never saw it before. I expect in a situation like that I should stay by the fire. And half the world would stay with you. Habit is a tremendous force. Habit keeps us where we are. Habit stabilizes social life. Habit dictates manners, behavior, right and wrong, good and evil. But of course there are always dissidents, people with aspirations who long for change, who live for the world to come. All the world's problems can be seen in the posting of a letter. The three forces are always in play, always changing. Posting the letter is just a snapshot the moment you saw. But while you were deciding whether to go out or not, the Earth was still turning round. There could be no day or night without its rotation, three forces. It was keeping station in its orbit round the Sun. Gravity is the third force. Look and you always find the law of three. We live in a dualistic world, right and wrong, black and white, yes and no. We're educated that way. So we never see, never even look for the third force, which is always there. We are third force blind. But you see what I mean about Gurdjieff? This is a typical example of how he takes a perfectly well-known assumption and gives it a new life. No bread without flour, water and fire. No play without an actor and an audience. No light without darkness and a bulb. The law of three is everywhere, on every scale. It's one of the primordial laws of life. God's thumbprint on the universe. And we just think of it as a lucky number. Well, you've convinced me of one thing anyway. But I still don't see how my personal problems are the same as social problems. I can't really relate to society. I know. Your personal problems have a personal flavor, of course. But isn't the underlying state just the same? I'm always short of money. Well, isn't every country in debt? I'm jealous, bad-tempered, depressed. Riots have exactly the same roots. The death wish that infects the world like a virus, I find it too in my frustration, my impatience. Don't we all want to destroy things that get in our way? Everything stems from you and me. It's no good trying to fob it off on others. You know, twice in his life, Gurdjieff set up his Institute for the Harmonious Development of Man. With infinite patience and perseverance, he tried to show us a new reality, and in connection with this third force, for instance, he explained how men and women could be divided into three categories. Those who live by their heads, those subject to their feelings, those who prefer to live by their habits, by imitation, by doing what was done the last time. All three aspects have their virtues. If a man's head rules his life, he will be cool, calculating, deliberate. If he lives by feeling, he will be generous, impulsive, volatile. If he relies solely on habit, he will be a plodder, meticulous, trustworthy. And all these three sides of us are mixed up in everybody. When they're out of balance, they lead to dictatorship, hysteria, or rigidity. But when the three impulses are fortunately combined, they can emerge to form a real man, not a man in quotation marks, which Gurdjieff always insisted that we are. But it seems to me that this is all utopia, way out of reach. Is the kingdom of heaven within reach? Probably not. Yet you believe in it, you desire it. We must have an aim, something to shoot for. Gurdjieff leads us through practical, almost prosaic things towards the mystery. But the law of three, when you come to think of it, holds a prominent place in the Gospels. The Holy Trinity 
is embedded into the consciousness of the human race despite all our shortcomings. Perhaps that is why the holy reconciling force is sometimes called the comforter. As this is the last time we shall be able to meet and talk about Gorgiev's teaching for a bit, could we recap? I've made some notes. By all means, go ahead. When you started off by telling me about Gurdjieff's life, I was quite astonished at the background. At his search, you mean? Yes, you can tell a lot about a man from his search. Gurdjieff's lasted for 20 years. His determination to get to the bottom of those supernatural things he saw around him when he was young crystallized into a set of ideas far beyond the superficial incidents that had set him off. Have you read all and everything? I started it, but I must say I found it difficult. The language... Yes, I know it isn't easy. But after all, it had taken him a lifetime to gather the material, and it provides endless fields of study for all serious people, artists, scientists, philosophers, teachers, anybody who really wishes to develop his understanding of life. Gurdjieff was a great believer in work. You have to earn your place in the spiritual world as much as in any other. More, maybe. Gurdjieff believed in quality. Quantity doesn't matter. You make it sound very exclusive. Do I? Well, it is and it isn't. Look, a man produces a unique new view of the way all life is put together and the way he, a man, is put together. There's nothing exclusive about it. It's there. It's in a book. You can read it. Anybody can read it. And maybe other books to start with, not so difficult. Well, there's nothing exclusive about that. But, of course, if you don't read it, that excludes you automatically. I must say, I found some of the ideas fascinating. That creation exists to counter the destruction of everything by time. I found that a wonderful idea. But all those different levels of life, I really didn't understand all that. It's a new way of understanding the way that creation comes down to us. God created the world and remains apart from his creation like all creators. The created world is the whole. It comprises everything, on all scales, at all levels. But within that whole, there's a lower order of radiating, life-giving entities called suns. And among those myriad suns, there is one, our sun, a lower order. Round our suns spin a family of planets, a lower order still, of which the Earth is one, a still lower order. And finally, there is the moon, the growing tip of the divine creation. These seven giant steps are the path by which the creation reaches us from the source. But I can't get used to the idea that the stars are alive. But how can it be otherwise? Creation means life. Everything must be alive. It's all a bit breathtaking. And then when you jump from that to saying that in the middle of this whirl of life, we're asleep. Well, that sounds more like chaos than the order you say Gurdjieff brings to everything. Yes, I know, I rushed you too much. But our time together is so short, and you're quite right. There is a contradiction here. Gurdjieff says that we Earth creatures are exceptions, the result of a mistake at higher levels, which, not entirely by our own fault, doomed us to a state of sleep, which is an abnormality, an illness, unknown, in normal free brain beings who inhabit other planets. But the illness, though grave, is not incurable. If we can wake up, even for a moment, we see that we are always asleep. And if this shakes us deeply, we may begin to struggle towards a self-conscious state. Self-conscious? Yes, present to life, here, now. While we are asleep, we do not consciously direct our lives Life goes on without us. It works, it plays, it laughs, it murders. We are not there. And from this, the terrifying unpredictability of the dream life proliferates. But as nobody believes it, everything goes on as before. We all need to go back to school. To school? Yes, to be taught we're asleep. Children catch on to it quicker than grown-ups. They're not so deeply asleep. Why do you suppose Jesus called for the children? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is the state of being awake. 
There's one thing you didn't mention, the place of science. Religion seems to have no answer to it, how to fit it in. It's done more to discredit the church than anything else. What does Gurdjieff have to say about that? Well, not much directly. He brings in some mathematics, actual numerical relationships between the different levels of life, the proliferating of laws and so on. And of course, there's the other primordial sacred law of the universe, the law of seven, which controls the processes by which all events happen. He gives innumerable instances of the way in which the law of three and the law of seven interact to govern the entire creation and the maintenance of life. But science, as we know it, is almost entirely concerned with research into material things, that is, into the ground floor of life. But there are other levels. Higher levels, you mean? He's always urging us towards a more refined state. Learn to separate the fine from the coarse, as old Trismegistus had it. Science may do wonders for our convenience, our comfort, or our health. That's all very fine as far as it goes, but it doesn't do much to develop our spiritual powers. Thanks to science, we're all enslaved by material things, which is putting us off balance and leading to disaster. At best, the ground floor of life is a place to eat, drink, and be merry. But upstairs are the bedrooms where the new life is conceived and born. Truth and understanding at higher levels do not exist at the lower levels. The lower levels cannot reach there. That is why all talk of science unveiling the mysteries of life and so on is nonsense. God is not mocked. We are two-natured. As long as our two natures are fighting one another, we are bound to live in conflict and misery. Only when the material begins to accept the care and love of the spiritual can there be beginnings of harmony. This is the crux of our dilemma. We must live in the world and struggle with the responsibilities of everyday life. And yet, at the same time, another part of us sees these worldly goals to be worthless. To try to harmonize the two is trying to balance on a razor's edge. We continually fall, one way or the other. So, as far as I understand you, at the end of all this struggle to reach a new reality, we come back to the old truths. Yes. They always need to be renewed in every age. Truth is the blood of life. It's always the same. But blood circulates and comes back to the heart to be refreshed. Gurdjieff is like the air. He oxygenates and clears away the sludge of old thoughts, old habits, old desires, and brings the health of a new life to all of us. And beyond this life, is he any clearer than others as to what may follow? We take what he says as far as we can. But now we're in the realms of mystery. If we understood more, we could go further. He teaches impartial justice, we get what we deserve. But also universal compassion. Of course God forgives everything, he says. There is a call for struggle to lighten the divine sorrow at the shortcomings of the creation. And a wonderful new spur to our longing for immortality in the promise that he needs us individually to help him in the governance of the enlarging world. Life is given us free, says Gurdjieff, but our growth in it we have to work for. There are two rivers of life. One gets lost in the depths of the earth, the other flows into the boundless ocean. But there is always the possibility of crossing from one river to another. It's not so easy just to wish and you cross. The crossing has to be prepared, worked for, longed for. We are not born with ready-made, fully grown souls but with an embryo whose growth depends upon the life we lead. So the fairy tale medieval dreams of heaven are set aside against a more logical possibility which appears. We can live as we please, but our future is linked to our past. I always wonder what happens to those serious struggling people who fall short in their aims, who don't get there, so to speak. Yes. So do I. If there is a there to get to. 
Gurdjieff says that conscious work is never wasted. What we have worked for belongs to us. The Bhagavad Gita of the Hindus takes rebirth for granted and says quite clearly that a good life merits a favorable rebirth. But all this is in the realms of conjecture. Gurdjieff once asked a young pupil to look out of the window and tell him what he saw. An oak tree was the reply. And how many acorns will fall from the tree? 10,000, 20,000, I don't know. And how many trees will grow from those acorns? One, two perhaps. Perhaps not even one, said Gurdjieff in his halting English. Must learn from nature. Nature make many acorns, but possibility become tree only for few. Same with man. Many men born, only few grow. People think this waste, think nature waste. Not so. Rest become fertilizer. Go back into earth and make possibility for more acorns, more men. Once in a while, more tree, more real man. Nature always give but only give possibility. To become real oak, real man, must make effort. Also, man can go wrong way by accident, become not real man, not fertilizer, but what you call good or evil, not proper thing for man. Real man, not good or evil. Real man only conscious. Only wish, grow soul for proper development. Think of good and evil like right hand, left hand. Man always have two hands, two sides of self, good and evil. One can destroy the other, must get third thing, thing that make peace between hands, conscience. Possibility for conscience already in man when born. This possibility given free by nature, but is only possibility. Real conscience grow from work by learning first to understand self. Even your religion have this phrase, know thyself. When begin, know self, already have possibility become genuine man. So first thing must learn know self by this exercise, self-observation. Self-observation? That's something new? No. It's what we've been talking about all the time watching what is going on in you, not being asleep. Talking with that 12-year-old boy, Gurdjieff gave a picture of what his aim in life could be and what would be its reward. To reach it, like all of us, he had only to wake up.